So good morning, everyone. Um, as Meng Meng told you, I'm Mike Merchant. I'm based in the Dallas, the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service Center in Dallas. I'm the urban entomologist up here. And uh, we're going to be talking today about a new scale pest of crepe myrtle. Um, we're calling it the crepe myrtle bark scale, although to be honest, uh, there is no official name for this pest yet. So <clears throat> crepe myrtle, of course, being a very important uh, landscape plant. Um, this insect pest does not um, appear to necessarily kill crepe myrtle, uh, and maybe economically it's not as important as some of our big agricultural pests, but um, this is a pest that's going to end up in a lot of people's backyards, so I think it's going to be a uh, pretty serious issue for many, many of us here in Texas. Um, this is the uh, location in Richardson, Texas, where we first discovered this uh, new scale. It's a commercial property in Richardson, and, and it was in 2004 um, in responding to a question about an unusual scale on a tree that we discovered that we had something a little unusual on our hands. Now you can notice even from this distant view the, uh, the dark, dark uh, color um, of the branches. Those should be white, just like the bottoms of the trunks are, but that is uh, that's residue, uh, mold residue from all the sticky do that's being emitted by the scale. This is a little closer up view of those same trees, and you can see upper limbs were completely encrusted with this scale. So if we look at it a little closer, you should be able to see some of these very tiny um, scale insects, that in this case just totally clustering uh, along the branch. And most of them uh, in this picture are in a large uh, nymph stage. There's a few adults. You see the white one there. You see a few uh, scattered nymphs here. Uh, so these are fairly small insects. Um, <clears throat> if you take your fingernail and uh, rub it across these scales, um, you may see some uh, red, pink, uh, pink blood, basically. So if you find a, a whitish insect on your crepe myrtle and um, you smash it and it bleeds pink, well, that's, you've got our critter here. So this, is, this is what you're looking for. Another little closer up view of this scale. And this shows um, lots of scale on the branch of crepe myrtle. And um, you'll all notice how black the branch is. This, this black is a sooty mold uh, growing on uh, honeydew that's encrusted the branches from these scales feeding. So as they feed, they're emitting uh, sugary exudates, which land on the tree, on the bark, and on the leaves. And eventually, that, that sticky um, layer will serve as a substrate for a black mold that will grow up, essentially turn the plant black. So um, not sure if you've got crepe myrtle bark scale or not. Um, if you see some um, white ink on the uh, bark, even if you don't see the scales in them before, um, you probably need to look a little closer. In this picture, you can see some of the white incrustations, probably where the scales have been pre preyed upon and eaten by lady beetles. But if you look a little closer, right here in this scar, you can see some of the live scale uh, cluster along the edge of the bark. So even with um, many of these uh, scale will survive uh, the winter and they're going to be very difficult to completely eradicate from the tree. Now this picture was taken by Bang Mang Gu uh, from China and uh, it shows it shows what the scale looks like in its native home and even in Asia these scale can be fairly troublesome and cause uh, aesthetic damage to, to plants. So this, we believe this scale um, comes from either China, Korea, or Japan. So just before we go any further, just a, a little review. Um, what are these insects? They don't look much like insects, but, um, but they are. Um, these are scales. Scales are relatives of aphids. Uh, they're in the same basic suborder, the home 
Um, there are several big families that, of, that we refer to sometimes as scales, including the mealybugs. Uh, Cochineal scale, which you're probably familiar with, especially if you're from the hill country of Texas, these uh, white scale that you see all over the cactus pads um, on prickly pear. Uh, Margaroted scales, Kermi scale, uh, pit scales, which you can see fairly uh, commonly um, some of our native trees. And the two most common scale families that we typically deal with in gardening and landscape management are the armored scales and the soft scales. Um, armored scales being an example being Euonymus scale, a soft scale example being brown soft scale. The main difference um, in in the obvious appearance between these two scale families is the armored scale uh, feed on parenchyma cell uh, contents in the plant. They do not produce honeydew. The soft scale uh, feed on the phloem tissue of the plant and they, and they produce lots of, of honeydew. So those are our two main scale families. And then we have the bark or sometimes called felt scales in the family Areococcidae. And this is the uh, scale that we're going to be talking about today scale family. So a little closer up view, a uh, very nice picture that was taken by Gary Brooks of Bayer Environmental Science. Um, so this shows adult female scales and adult male scales that would be found underneath more narrow elongated scale coverings. Plus you're seeing some immature scales um, that are in color with kind of white hairs all over them. So these are, these are uh, this is a good representation of some of the images that you're going to find on a scale encrusted branch. You can kind of guess why they might be called uh, felt scale because they do kind of look like felt when you look at them up close, at least the uh, adult uh, scale covers. So, um, and these are typically found on bark. So bark scale or felt scale are both appropriate common names for this family. So uh, I mentioned that the very first scale were found in Richardson, Texas in 2004. And this map shows a progression of uh, where they've been found. So knowledge. Um, in 2004, a uh, red dot there. And between 2005 and 2007, this gets spreading throughout Collin and Dallas County. Uh, 2008 through 10, it uh, more spread more throughout the entire uh, Dallas-Fort Worth metroplex. And, Denton uh, areas up there. 2011, we had Ardmore, Oklahoma, which is this uh, light yellow spot right there. 2012, we started to get further out reports, still close to the Metroplex area, however. And then 2013, last year was our big year. This is where we started getting reports of the scale from uh, Grayson County, um, out in the Tyler area, Longview. Shreveport, Louisiana, New Orleans, uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, and Germantown, Tennessee. So we have uh, records now uh, as of last year from all of these locations. And then um, just at the beginning of this year, Dr. Goose sent me a sample from College Station that uh, appears to be the same scale. So um, we think that uh, that those first 10 years or so, of, or first six years or so of the scale was um, certainly assisted, but also probably some natural spread in the Dallas Fort Worth not seem to move super quickly, uh, in, in a year or so, but the, the pattern that we're seeing along the major interstates and, and commerce uh, corridors would indicate that um, the longer distance spread is certainly man-assisted, um, probably through um, crepe myrtle plants being moved from one area to another. Well, initially, when the scale was identified back in 2004, it was identified as Areococcus azaleae, also known as the azalea bark scale. And uh, this was a little strange because uh, Areococcus azaleae had never been found on crepe myrtle before, even though crepe myrtle and the scale have been in close proximity for many years. Um, and we in the scientific community sort of were of the mind, well, maybe this is a, um, this is a host, a case of switching or host jumping, um, an insect being able to pick up 
on a new host and adapt to a new host. Um, this, uh, you can see that uh, the, the Azalea bark scale actually has a pretty wide host range, but it does not include Ladrostromia, which is the genus of crepe myrtle. And uh, the idea was pretty positive. It was done by an expert in scales from, uh, and uh, that's what they thought we had. Um, <clears throat> Several years ago, after the initial identification, um, I had some communication with the identifier in Washington, D.C., and he mentioned to me, oh, by the way, there is another scale species that uh, feeds on Adrostromia, the crepe myrtle, and uh, it lives in Asia. So there's a possibility it could be this other scale, even though he had keyed it out and, and identified it as, as aliae. Um, this other scale, Areococcus um has a, also a fairly wide host range, and uh, this, this list is of the different species that it infests, is known to infest. You can see our, our crepe myrtle here, Lagostromia indica and japonica. Um, then uh, also has some exotic plants like most. And um, the, the ones that I've colored in blue slide, Ligustrum, these are, these are genera and, and species that are found in the U.S., so Ligustrum may be a possible host. host. Ica granatum, the, the um, uh, pomegranate, is also known host. Celtis, or uh, elm, um, tackberry genus, is also potential host. Buxus my, microphylla, this is a, a boxwood, so that, that could possibly be a host. Uh, domestic apple, Malus domestica. Uh, Dyrospiros, which is the persimmon, uh, glycine max bean, and ficus, um, I believe this is the tree. Um, so uh, this potentially could be a pest problem on other plant crepe myrtle, although um, I don't know how uh, common these scale are found on, on these uh, alternate plant species. It, it certainly is a species that's named after uh, crepe myrtle. So this is the native home for Areococcus hydrostromia. Uh, you can see it's in, found in Japan. Um, this doesn't mark Korea, but uh, Korea, um, China, and Mongolia are all native homes for this particular plant pest. So um, the exact identity of the scale has been kind of a mystery for 10 years. We've uh, suspected that it was a different, this, this uh, Ladrostromia species. But um, the conclusion was it couldn't be morphologically identified or distinguished from the um, azalea bark scale. So we've been working this year with a couple of um, uh, entomologists with specialty in genetic analysis of genome, uh, genomics that allow them to look into the DNA of the scale and um, they can compare it to the DNA known species and see uh, what's the map. And uh, they actually use a, a gene called the seal cytochrome oxidase subunit 1, which is used as a barcoding uh, gene for identifying species. And it's got a very wide usefulness uh, for that purpose. And a small section of that gene, uh, there are at least two to reach a small section of that gene, and uh, they, they are they can genetically distinguish this scale. Oops. Um, so there's a 99 percent to the uh, genome sequence pushed for Areococcus ladrostromia with our uh, um, anything less than one or two percent differences usually in line with uh, normal species variability. And um, we have a taxonomist. The taxonomist in, uh, in Washington, D.C., a new taxonomist has been looking very closely at these scale samples. And he believes he held morphological differences now between these two species. So line drawing is the kind of identification uh, that morphologists do on scale. They look at uh, little CT and locations of, of hairs and and other things on scale, scales have been mounted on microscope slides, and it's a highly specialized skill to be able to do that. So how did this little insect get in the U.S.? 
Well, the most likely scenario is that these scale have come into the U.S. through luggage of uh, passengers um, that have escaped detection through the normal quarantine process. There's, a, I would say, a good chance that somebody um, a crepe myrtle scale cutting from uh, the, their home in China or Japan or Korea and brought it into the U.S. and planted it in their backyard, thinking that would be nice to have a crepe myrtle from, from home in their yard. This is a big no-no. You don't do this uh, with plants. That's why we have quarantine systems, why we're not supposed to uh, uh, have un unsterilized plants or soil or seed brought over from another country because of the possibility of bringing a pest in. Um, this is, I contacted a uh, friend in the USDA APHIS um, off to Fort Worth Airport, and he was kind enough uh, a couple of years ago to print me out this list of all of the uh, interceptions that they had made at the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport from different con con countries of um, Ariococcus scales. And um, in 2009, they had intercepted 168 different Ariococcus samples from passengers' baggage um, in, uh, in, in the airport. So even though we don't have proof, that uh, absolute proof that this is how they came in, there's a very good likelihood, given the, the commonness of people trying to bring uh, plants and baggage from overseas. This is, um, this is McKinney, Texas's uh, crepe, myrtle scale, uh, crepe Myrtle Trails of McKinney. And uh, this was a location that a few years ago, um, very soon after the scale came into the Dallas area, uh, began to notice large amounts of scale problems on these trees. It's also uh, the city of McKinney was kind enough to allow us to go out and do some research on their, um, their medians along the roads uh, to to test some different insecticides for controlling these scale. So um, in 2008 and 2009, I was working out field with these scale. This is, again, before we knew exactly what the scale was. And uh, in 2008, initially, we looked at some, um, we looked at horticultural oil and malathion as possible treatments. So these are fairly cheap and ubiquitous insecticides that just about anybody would have access to. Um, we also used uh, some systemic insecticides that we could inject soil around the basis of these trees. Um, we repeated some of those treatments in 2009. Um, actually, a, it was a trial funded by the company uh, Syngenta, and uh, they wanted us to test specific products uh, at different, different way, means of application. Location. We have two years worth of data right now, and this is, as far as I know, the only years of worth of U.S. data uh, con concerning the control of these scale. Um, the exact treatments that we used in 2008 included a foliar trunk spray with malathion. Um, now this is a one-time spray, uh, so we we haven't probably probed the utility of these particular um, insecticides, but one-time spray with malathion one-time spray with horticultural oil, um, and then uh, one-time treatments with uh, several insecticides that belong to the neonicotinoid class, including acetam, clothionidin, dinotepuran, imidacloprid, and thymethon. <clears throat> so you can see that we, we actually had a pretty good, good spread. Um, this data shows uh, uh, graphics, the method for counting scales on these trees, um, their, their overall abundance. And let me explain this graph to you. This, this particular, if you follow all of those down here, the bars on this uh, lower uh, range of bars, uh, this is our control plots. This is the, these bars, each of the bars represent the number of scales found on the, on the branch. And you can see uh, starting out with zero weeks after treatment up to 12 weeks after treatment, um, the scale populated on our control trees pretty significantly during the test. Um, if you look at the horticultural oil treatment, uh, again, we had some pretty significant increases. Um, there would be no significant difference between the controls in the horticultural oil or the controls in the malathion tree. Horticultural oil and malathion didn't really do a whole lot for us of other treatments that were non-soil uh, treatments. 
Meridian and Trar um, that didn't do very well. But when we got down to the soil treatments uh, with Meridian, uh, soil treatment in or arena, and imidacloprid and methuran, we did see significant suppression of the scales of those treatments. Now this was an application that was made on the 22nd of July. We also had applications made in June and in March, and um, we did not see any effect of March applications of these soil applied insecticides. The uh, mid-June application did have uh, very similar results to what you see in this graph. So right now, we're suggesting that if you're going to use an insecticide, uh, you might want to use one of these four products and uh, no sooner than May, um, sooner than May or June, um, certainly a March application early based on the data that we've gotten so far. Now, this graph is a little, maybe a little trickier to interpret, but this is the relative proportion of adults, nymphs, and crawlers that we were finding on scale branches. And what we're seeing here is um, very low numbers of crawlers here, uh, proportions of crawlers. Um, we're seeing, um, we saw three peaks in the in nymph, nymphal composition on these plants. Um, so based on this data, we think that there currently are three generations of scale right now that are um, multiplying on trees. This is very preliminary data. It needs to be supported by some additional years research. But uh, there's possibly three generations of scale going on on these trees, which means that adults will appear three times in larger numbers each summer. Syngenta was very interested in whether scale populations might be contributing to ant uh, infestations around houses because there, we have a number of ants, such as odorous house ant and crazy ant, that feed on uh, exudations from scale insects. So we did some testing in 2008. Uh, I'm not going to present that data, but looking also at ant populations that might have been affected by these treatments on these trees. Um, the, what I'm just going to show you is the bottom line. How well did the, the treatments control the scale on the trees? You can see here's our control numbers uh, in this, in this uh, column. And uh, actually, the control actually went down throughout the trial a couple weeks, which is not unusual for an insecticide trial. But we still saw the same uh, pattern uh, um, of uh, getting best control from our, our soil sprays and dressing here. And this was... Um, uh, thiamethox ingredient in these particular trials, and also merit in the cloper treatment. So what we're seeing on merit is after about four weeks, uh, pretty heavy suppression of the scale. So um, that kind of summarizes what we know about these scale right now. This is sure showing a lady beetle, beetle called the twice stab lady beetle. Uh, feeding on scale, and that was one of the things that we noticed early on, was that we had some pretty voracious uh, lady beetle predators, in particular this this little guy right here. Um, tiny lady beetle with two red spots, hence the name. You can see another view of this lady beetle right here on a tree trunk. Now this picture shows um, uh, the pupae and pre-pupae, as well as a single adult of the twatty beetle on the trunk of a tree. And the interesting thing is with these lay beetles, they will congregate on one particular part of the tree to pupate. And um, so here, here's a pre-pupa. This is what the larva looks like, only it's a little faded in color and starting to swell up and, get, and turn into a pupal stage. And then, uh, then the ones that with the split skin back, these are actually the pupae. They're attached to the trunk. If you see these on a tree, this is not a pest. These are your good guys. You definitely want to see these little ladybugs uh, cluster all over your tree. And they will do this to your crepe myrtle scale population. They basically, in this tree, they've cleaned off all the scale that were clustered on the trunk. So these are definitely helping us in the uh, fight against this crepe myrtle bark scale. So as far as information goes, um, I do have, uh, I've, for the last four years, I've had this publication up um, 
just summarizing what we knew about crepe myrtle. Um, this is still mostly relevant information on this site. Um, so that's on the Insects in the City website, citybugs.tamu.edu. And I would invite anybody um, that's uh, listening to this webinar today to visit that site. And, uh, and if you're interested, uh, there's actually, an, you have the ability down here on the sidebar, you can fill in your email and um, get into, um, you can get into the site to, um, to subscribe to the site. And so anything new that's published on the scale will show up on the, uh, in your email. Um, we also, uh, Dr. Gu and I have just uh, published a new, uh, ex a more official extension fact sheet on this scale. Uh, EHT 049, and this is available through the Texas AgriLife Bookstore. So um, if you go to um, www.agrilifebookstore.org and type in the search window Crate Myrtle, uh, spelling it's R-A-P-E-M-Y-R-T-L-E, that's how Mung Mung and I decide to spell it in this publication, uh, you will find a link to this particular fact sheet and you can download it for free. So I um, encourage you to, to consider doing that. And uh, I believe that's all I had for my presentation, uh, Dr. Gu. Um, if there are some questions, I guess we can uh, address those. Now. Okay, uh, back, back to me. Um, I just want to remind everyone that within this uh, uh, spring quick bite webinar series, there are three more coming up. Update on Rose Rosette and two LSU trial garden highlights. Um, and the, the, um, the extension publication that Mike, Dr. Merchant mentioned is free for download from the AgriLife uh, bookstore, so that's good. And the other thing is if you have seen something that, uh, that Dr. Merchant, similar to the things that Dr. Merchant has described in this presentation, please mail your, you know, some, some of the uh, suspicious Great Myrtle Bar Scale samples to me and then I will consolidate those and send it to a USDA for morphological um, identification and this is my contact information um, so this is this anyway and uh, for some of you who wasn't able to uh, listen very well or you know you want to come back to see this again this will be posted on YouTube um, and you could you know come back and, 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 and view this uh, recorded uh, video so now we're going to go to questions and the first one is from Jim. Jim asked, these scales will be considered a soft scale as well as a bark scale. Uh, Mike, this is for you. Um, actually, soft scales are another family of scales. They're the coccidae. These are the areococcidae. So they're actually a different on a soft scale. They're their own family. We just refer to them as bark scales or felt scales. Okay. Uh, the next one is 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 less. Uh, is is more a uh, a sharing experience. Um, it's from Neil. Uh, his personal observation that may or may not be accurate. He has observed this pest for past ten years from McKinney, most prominently on younger plants and also on most often on Lactostromia foria hybrids than the Indicus. Also, they're much more troublesome in years when we have uh, very wet. Uh, late springs and early summers. 2007 was the one extremely bad year with record rainfall in um, Dallas-Fort Worth area in June. It would be good to know if others have or have had any of these same observations. So if you have, you know, or have not, just uh, type those uh, observations in the question box and I'll share with the others. Mike, do you want to do you want to comment on this, or should we go to the next question? Yeah. 
um, at the McKin Great Crepe Myrtle Trails in McKinney. So um, his, his observations have been very valuable to us. And um, I think the interesting thing was 2007 was a really bad year. Of course, we came in in 2008 and did our research. So we didn't have quite as high numbers, uh, which would be great for insecticide trials uh, as they did in 2007. But that's the way it usually works with entomology research. Okay, the next one is from Heath. Uh, the uh, uh, xylem liquid is another dinotepiron product available to the professional market in the quad tip and measure. So and then that's the end of it. Uh, I guess that's uh, that's. Up. Yes, and among them, uh, and there are several trade names for this active ingredient. Uh, okay. Dinotepiron is probably the fastest acting of the. Uh, neonicotinoid uh, soil treatments. Um, it's a very good product and um, I would recommend for most people if you're doing it at home you can drench the root zone around the, the base of the crepe myrtle tree uh, with a mixture of dinotephran according to the label instructions. You don't need any fancy equipment. We actually used injection rods in our trials but that was to just make sure that we got the insecticide into the root zone. Uh, for most people, you can do the same exact thing by uh, pouring the drench into the soil around the base of the tree. It will work quite well. And the uh, trade name for um, most of the consumer products, I know Greenlight makes a, a, a homeowner version of, of Dinotephran. They call it Safari. So Safari is another trade, both professional and homeowner um, name for these products. Uh, the next question is, are there any organic control methods that work? Well, um, in response to that, certainly the ladybird beetles work. The problem with uh, lady beetles is that uh, they don't work fast enough. And um, I don't know of any uh, commercial sources of lady beetles that you could actually go out and buy. It shouldn't be necessary if you have a healthy backyard environment or uh, nursery environment. There should be these uh, lady beetles should be there naturally. Um, now depending on your definition of organic, um, if you're willing to accept the use of horticultural oil, that would be what I would call a low impact control method. Um, we don't have data right now that shows that uh, oil works very well on the scales, but I'm not sure we've given oil a fair shake. We, we did a one-time one application of oil treatments to the trees, and uh, that didn't seem to do a whole lot, but that doesn't mean that a, a dormant season treatment with uh, uh, winter rates of horticultural oil might, might not be uh, somewhat effective, and maybe repeated applications of oils. If there was an organic uh, treatment, um, it, it would have to be something that would have some residual or that would have to be reapplied uh, fairly frequently in order to work. And we just haven't, we haven't gotten that, that far into the uh, trying different products to, to not have a good answer for that question. The, the next question is, uh, has this been found in any nurseries? Well, um, I haven't um, inspected any uh, local nurseries up here for this scale. However, I have seen it in uh, retail nurseries being sold um, on, on crepe myrtles. So um, it certainly is, is in, the, um, in the commercial nursery trade. I have no doubt about that. And that's probably, just speculating, but that's probably one of the, one of the ways it's being spread across the country is, is likely on nursery material. There's no quarantine on this particular scale yet. However, um, the state of Arkansas this spring just started a stop sale uh, uh, on, tree, on crepe myrtles that have been found to be infested with this, this scale. The bad news is, is that nobody has a, uh, an approved quarantine treatment uh, for this. So I'm not sure exactly how Arkansas is handling um, uh, crepe myrtles that have been found infested with these scales, um, it probably will end up with some kind of requirement for a neonicotinoid drench to, uh, to treat these, but uh, that's just speculation on my part right now. The, the, the reason 
we haven't gotten any further on this is that the regulators didn't know for sure whether this was a, indeed an exotic pest or not. And I think we're very close to being able to uh, publish information that shows that it is an exotic insect. Mike, the next question is about the lady beetles. Are the lady beetles that are sold in many nurseries just as effective as the two spotted type that you showed? Well, I will answer that question by just observation. Um, I have never seen the uh, convergence lady beetle, which is the species typically sold in the nursery trade. I've never seen that feeding on the scale. We certainly have convergence lady beetles uh, native occurring um, in the landscapes here. And I would think that if it was an important predator on these scale, we would have seen it. Um, on the other hand, I haven't, um, we have done very little research on biological control. It's something that we hope to look at a little more carefully um, this year and the next couple of years. So we'll have a better idea of whether those, those lady beetles would have an effect on the scale or not. The, um, the other thing, in just a more general answer to your question, generally I don't recommend uh, purchase and release of, of uh, lady beetles uh, for pest control because um, they're very expensive. Uh, they tend to, that are released in the field, um, tend to disperse within 48 hours after release, regardless of the conditions that they're placed under, um, whether it's cloudy or whether there's water on the foliage or what. Um, that's just their biology is to fly after they've been uh, released from hibernation, which is essentially what you're doing with uh, um, buy and release ladybugs. So um, the answer to your question, I, I don't think that these types of lady beetles um, would be uh, the, w the way to go with a control program. Mike, the next question is, is orange oil considered one of the uh, horticulture oils that were used in your trial? We did not test orange oil. Um, orange oil would be a type of plant oil um, that has perhaps a little more um, killing action or additional killing properties than just a, a, a straight horticultural oil has. Um, orange oil is also very frequently uh, phytotoxic to plants, so I'd be very careful using orange oil on trees um, because you might damage the tree with that particular product. Um, horticultural oil that we used in our trials was sunspray horticultural oil, which is a very high quality uh, petroleum-based oil um, that, uh, even though it's not organic, has very very good environmental properties and is uh, usually fairly effective on on a number of scale pests, but no, we didn't look at orange oil. Okay, uh, the, the next question is uh, please uh, elaborate on time of treatment. Well, I wish I could elaborate on time of treatment uh, more than I already have. Um, all I can tell you is what we've done research on, and we had three applications, one in March, one in June, and one in July in our 2008 trial, trials and the treatments in March did absolutely nothing to the scales. The ones made in June and July did have a significant effect on scales. So um, this is a good example of how it, it frequently takes years of trials with insecticides to uh, fine tune a control a set of control recommendations. And undoubtedly, we'll have to do much more detailed, fine scale type um, uh, evaluations of insecticides on the scale to know more precisely when exactly it would be a good time to treat. But right now, I, I, all I can tell you is the June and July treatments worked and the March treatments didn't. So you can take that information and do what you want with it. Well, thank you, Mike. Uh, there's uh, one small comment from the audience saying that, uh, that, that uh, this has been observed in, the, in a small production nursery. So, okay. and, and I don't know where that nursery is, but uh, so that's from the uh, that's from the audience. Um, if, it's a, if it's a production nursery that's not in one of our locations I showed you on that map, um, which we would sure like to know just to be able to to have a, a note on a location. Um, and also that that comment goes for anybody if if you're in any communities, parts of Texas or out of the state that are seeing these scale. We are um, trying to keep track of the spread of the scale, and we we very much appreciate a picture and a location of where you're seeing these scales, and you can send that to either Meng Meng Gu or myself, 
and um, and we'll put you on the map. We uh, ultimately hope to um, start um, a citizen science site where you can online automatically upload pictures and location information for uh, finding the scale. And uh, we will try to get that information out through my website and other venues when, when that's available. The next question is about what kind of funding would assist in further research? Well, certainly any funding would help. Um, it's, I haven't been doing research on this the last few years because I didn't have funding. Um, the state of Texas wasn't willing to fund research on an insect that they didn't think was an exotic pest. Um, we might be able to, to loosen some funds up from, from Texas Department of Agriculture, although they don't have a lot of money for research. Um, TNLA has also was the funding source for the 2000, I should mention that earlier, was the funding source for the 2008 research, uh, but they declined to uh, fund us the second year that we requested it, and we have not requested more since. Um, you, know, you know, if you're asking how much funding, typically these kinds of studies um, require you know ten thousand dollars or more to uh, put on a summer's worth of, of research and hire research technicians to do the work. Um, before uh, more question coming in, uh, I would like to. Well, we have two more guests from Arkansas, Dr. Jim Robbins and Dr. John Hopkins, on this uh, webinar. And, and, and Dr. Robbins and Dr. Hopkins, do you have anything, observation that, uh, that, that you have from Arkansas, from the Little Rock area, that you want to share with the, uh, with the rest of the group? Yeah, this is uh, John Hopkins. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, we've been doing uh, some crawler counts, trapping them on uh, double-sided you know, double tape. And we just started that uh, a couple of weeks ago. And the, the first set of uh, little sticky traps averaged about one and a half crawlers per uh, sticky trap. And then a week and a half later, which was yesterday, we were averaging 26.4 crawlers per sticky tape for you know, what that's worth. So basically, with the temperature warming up, we're seeing more crawlers on the sticky looks that, tape. Looks that way, and uh, you know, with uh, Mike treating in March, and then again in June and July, it, it lends a, a question as to whether how effective a treatment targeted at crawlers would be, say, in mid-April to May time frame. And, and of course, you're. Uh, you're from Little Rock. You're a little right. north of uh, um, Texas. Yeah. And that's Mike. a very useful observation, John, because um, uh, crawlers are the most vulnerable stage to any kind of foliar. Susceptible to pyrethroid sprays and, and that type of uh, treatment, whereas uh, you know, foliar applications of our neonicotinoids are probably going to go by the wayside with right. the bee hazard business. That's all I've got. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Hopkins. Thank you. Um, we uh, that uh, we don't have any more uh, questions coming in uh, before we end this webinar. Uh, Dr. Robbins, Dr. Hopkins, and Dr. Merchant, uh, do you all have any uh, closing up uh, statement? I, I don't, Mung Mung. I appreciate uh, everybody being interested in this uh, past and, and uh, anybody that has any uh, new geographical uh, instances to report, we appreciate that. Yeah, okay. All right. Well, um, I guess this, is the, uh, this concludes our webinar today and we invite you to answer a very short seven question evaluation survey at the end. And again, this webinar is co-sponsored by TNLA and Southern Region Risk Management Education Center. And it's very important that we provide feedback about these webinars to our grantors, providing funding to offset the uh, cost of the webinars. And with that, uh, this is the end of our webinar, and you have a great day. <laughs>